Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final presentation of our series this year. We've had some great meetings uh, in this series, and uh, tonight, outstanding presentation about another organization here in Spencer that has endured for a long, long time and helped to shape our attitude and our heritage. And uh, so we're very fortunate tonight <clears throat> to have the manager of the Clay County Fair with us. He's been here for about 11 years now. And uh, always great things happening every year at the Clay County Fair. So it is my privilege and my honor to introduce him to you tonight. So please welcome Jeremy Parsons. Thank you for that introduction, Bob. So it's good to be here tonight and uh, really to talk about probably the one thing that Spencer is known for the most. I think if we travel anywhere in the world uh, and you mention Spencer, Iowa, they're either going to talk about the fair or the cat. <laughs> one, or, one or the other, right? So anyway, so let's, let's talk about the fair tonight. And you know, it was really difficult as, as I was kind of putting this presentation together, um, you know, how, how do you cover, what do you cover? You know, I could do an hour presentation just on grandstand entertainment or 4-H programs. Um, so what do you cover in this? And, and when I really thought about it, this picture, which was actually taken at the very first fair in 1918, uh, really sums up in my mind what the fair is about. The fair is about people and it's also about the place, the, the fairgrounds where it happens. So tonight we're really just going to focus kind of on the people uh, and the place uh, involved with the Clay County Fair. But as always, um, there's a backstory. And of course, if you're familiar with Spencer, you know just a few years ago we celebrated the fair centennial. But that was not the first fair in Clay County. In fact, we have to go all the way back to 1871. That's when the first fair was held in Clay County in October of that year, 1871. Uh, fairs were held in 71, 72, and 73, and then they ended in 1874 because a grasshopper plague came through Clay County and no one had anything to show at the fair. So there was no fair uh, in 1874, and it just ended at that point. Um, in 1879, and you see that there on the, ooh, Alex gave me this really cool toy. You see this here on the stockholder certificate. Uh, in 1879, the new uh, County Agricultural Board was started, and they held uh, the first fair September 17th through the 19th in 1879. Um, it was actually held at the Lamberton Homestead northwest of Spencer, and a half-mile track was put in, a half-mile dirt track was put in. My understanding is that Lamberton um, Homestead is actually just north and west of the current fairgrounds, actually. Um, but it was held there uh, starting again in 1879, and the financial panic of 1893 ended that association. <laughs> so uh, the current Clay County Fair Association is actually the third iteration of it. Um, we, started, we started the first two. So in 1913, uh, a group of local businessmen got together and decided to start the Clay County Fair and Picnic. And that started in 1913. Um, it was held on a grove in some property owned by the Tuttle family, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, but in 1913 is when the uh, one-day Clay County Fair Picnic was established, and it really is the precursor to what we have today. So the beginning of the Fair Association. I, I think also tonight, hopefully, um, you know, I've discovered in my 11 years in Spencer, people, as they do in all small towns, like to talk uh, at coffee shops, for example. That never happens here, I know. And one of the things they love to talk about is the fair. So I also hope tonight to dispel several urban myths, and we're going to start right away with one. In the fall of 1916, the voters of Clay County authorized the Board of Supervisors to buy land in the amount of $12,000 for county fair purposes. Uh, that property was the Tuttle Grove. 
So the original 40 acres of the fairgrounds. How many of you thought that land was donated by the Tuttle family? It was not. It was purchased. And if you really want some interesting history, that land was purchased by Clay County, by the county, in the fall of 2016. And as we were doing some title opinions a few years ago, we discovered, like in 2015, that the county had never transferred ownership of that land to the Fair Association. And for 100 years, the county had owned that original 40 acres and never known it. And we thought we owned it. So thankfully, we worked with the Board of Supervisors to do a quick claim deed, and we now own our original 40 acres. Uh, but that started in the fall of 1916. The voters authorized the board uh, to purchase that land. Um, and then in the winter of 1916 through the spring of 1917, a stock drive was conducted uh, for the purpose of, and you see the quote there, conducting annually one of the largest stock shows in northern Iowa. When you really think about that, that's a very interesting time in history. World War I is going on. And a group of people are going door to door in Clay County asking you for $100 to start this fair. I literally looked it up about an hour ago. Today that amount is $2,258.66. So that, that's a significant contribution uh, to really get this fair started. That happened through the winter and spring of 1916-1917. Of and what's interesting is at that time also there was a desire to build a fairgrounds that people would be proud of. And in fact, E.S. Perry, who was the first manager of the Clay County Fair, had this to say. I remember Mr. Robinson, representing a firm in Des Moines, came to Spencer and furnished us with plans for a model fairgrounds. Then began a series of meetings that many times lasted until the small hours of the morning where plans and suggestions were put forth, and everyone had a better suggestion how to run a fair. When the fact of the matter was, none of us knew a thing about how to run a fair, but by going to other towns and visiting other fairgrounds. In these meetings, everyone had an idea of his own, as for instance, one wanted lots of barn room, another lots of grandstand room, and another wanted a bigger racetrack, and so on. And always we thought we were building big enough for years to come, but how little we knew has been proven by the additions and enlargements that has been made as time went on. So they had all these meetings. And as you could imagine, uh, there's, there's really not a better way to kill anything than with meetings and committees, right? So on July 2nd, 1917, they had raised $18,000. And again, think about that. 180 people coughed up more than $2,000 apiece in the middle of World War I to start a fair. What's that again? How many? 180 people. How much? $100 a piece. Okay. I'm glad we have an accountant here, Merlin. That's good. <laughs> to keep me straight. So $18,000 in capital was raised, and the land was purchased, and they met uh, at the courthouse to organize a new Clay County Fair. They had the land. They had the money. But by July, they realized they had no time to build a fairgrounds. So they actually waited to have the first fair until 1918. So again, as you know with Spencer history, the fair has always celebrated its anniversaries based on the incorporation of the fair association, not uh, really the 100th anniversary of the first fair. Um, so then, in October of that year, the Clay County Fair Association established was established in a meeting that was held at the Grand Opera House downtown and it was incorporated on October 20th 1917 and at that time the board and officers were elected plans were finalized and then construction began that spring for the first fair that was going to happen in 1918 um, that first fair uh, this is kind of interesting was held September 24th through the 27th and um, my, one of, another one of my predecessors, Mr. Bacon, who was a later secretary of the fair, said this, the Clay County Fairgrounds were finished minutes before the gates were due to open. <laughs> the morning of the opening day of the fair, I helped fair board members and other interested persons carry scraps of lumber out to the grounds as the carpenters were pounding their last nails into place 
desperately trying to finish so that the fair patrons could be seated for the afternoon races. <laughs> and what a fair they had in 1918. Uh, they didn't know it at the time, but it was six weeks before the armistice that ended World War I. In fact, you see the fair theme that year. This is a poster from that very first fair in 1918. Better farm products will help win the war. Right down there at the bottom. Um, and it was a great fair, that very first fair in 1918. More than 30,000 people attended the very first Clay County Fair, which made it the largest county fair in the state from the very beginning. Um, it was wartime, so the 4th Iowa Infantry National Guard provided security. Uh, the governor attended and opened the fair on opening day with a large parade, and the night shows featured a soloist, the Florida Troubadours, who were America's premier roller skaters, a trapeze daredevil who performed without a net, and a fireworks display called the Battle of the North Sea. So every night that show was presented in the grandstand. So the fair started, as I just said, with, with really as large as, as it could be. It was the largest fair in Iowa the very first year it was held. So um, I, I know these are also interactive sessions. If any of you have questions, jump in here um, as we kind of go through some of this stuff. Questions or comments, I've got several resources that I can dig into if I have to. So I wanted to talk, though, a lot about the people who really were responsible for putting on the fair. Because when you really think about it, um, it requires a pretty special group of people, first of all, to go out and bang on doors to raise money for that fair. But then secondly, uh, to have this vision to, to have this big fair uh, right off the bat. And so who were these visionaries that created this event? Well, here is the first executive committee of the Clay County Fair Association. Uh, the president was Roy G. Webb, the secretary was E.S. Perry, uh, C.P. Bucky, B.F. Felt, I.N. Kirby, and you go through the rest of that list, you see a lot of familiar Spencer names. Wilson Cornwall, J.E. McClurg, J.H. McCord, W.J. Corey, and Otto Bernstead. Uh, those names have been featured at a lot of these other uh, workshops as well, or these other presentations as well. People who did a lot of things to really get Spencer uh, on the map. And really, uh, that vision has continued. Uh, as you know, the Fair Association started in 1917. Uh, since that time, only 83 individuals have served on the Fair's executive committee. What's fascinating is the Fair's governance structure has not really changed since 1917, where the membership elects a 27-person board of directors who then elects a 10-member executive committee but only 83 individuals over the past 100 years have ever served on the Fair Executive Committee. Uh, the longest serving member was Lo Roy LeBrant. And Roy LeBrant served on the Executive Committee from 1924 to 1960, uh, 37 years. Um, and the first woman on the Fair Executive Committee is here tonight. Dana Metcalf was elected in 2011. <laughs> uh, but she was, she was the first woman elected to the Executive Committee. So. Um, again, the vision, the vision really kind of continues. Um, I found this interesting. This comes out of the Spencer Reporter, November 20th, 1918. We talked about all these preliminary fair associations. So Mr. Jabez Webb um, got his $3 refunded because he had an old stockholders pass from the old fair association, and he kept it. He had kept it since 1888. Uh, he kept 20 years. And so while there is no connection between the old association and the present, they decided to recognize the bond and, and, and honored the past. I thought that was, a, that was probably a big debate item at the Fair Executive Committee after that 1918 fair. So the first president of the Fair Association is Roy G. Webb. Um, and this uh, was after he'd been elected to, to four years as president of the association. Uh, he came from a prominent family in Spencer. Uh, he spent time as president of the school board. He spent time as president of the Masonic Temple Association and, of course, was the first president of the Clay County Fair Association. He farmed in Summit Township uh, where uh, he had 600 sheep, 150 cattle, and lots of hogs. He was born in 1879 and died in 1942. Anybody want to know where he lived in Spencer? 
Where did he live? Where did he live? Does anybody know, really? He built the Parker house. That was his home. He built the Parker house. Yeah, the Webbs built the Parker house, and then the Parkers moved into it later. But, um, yeah, uh, definitely an interesting uh, person in Spencer history. So you look at the presidents of the Fair Association. Um, you see names like Bruce Knoll, who was president of Farmers Bank. You see names like Bob Keir, who is a state, legislate, state legislator. You see a lot of businessmen. You see attorneys. Uh, that's the list of the fair presidents. And again, even that list is, is relatively small when you really look at it. Um, Dave Sinington is the longest serving president uh, in fair history, and he will maintain that title, uh, mainly because in 2015 we had some bylaw changes, and now our presidents are term limited. They can just serve three years as president. So this list will get longer as history goes on. Um, but again, a list of some other names that you probably recognize. L.A. Witter was also a banker uh, here in Spencer. Um, and, and just an interesting list of people that, again, have had a lot of different connections to the community. Also, you see the asterisk up there by presidents. Uh, the other change that happened in 2015 is we went through a corporate kind of change. They are no longer presidents of the board. They're chairman of the board. So that's the asterisk there uh, representing that. So the other people involved with the fair are the people in my role, and that's, that's as secretary of the fair association. Uh, also very interesting, from 1917 to 1946, so from E.S. Perry to um, W.J. Knipp, uh, or Nip, I don't know how you pronounce it, I guess. Uh, those individuals, is it Nip, is that right? Nip. Those individuals uh, were part-time secretary of the fair, or part-time manager of the fair, and they were part-time director of the Spencer Commercial Club, now known as the Chamber of Commerce. So those individuals were, were part-time. Uh, part-time fair, part-time Chamber of Commerce. Uh, because of that, of course, the fair offices were downtown uh, from the very beginning and actually were downtown until 1977. Uh, and although this position split with Ben Nelson in 1947, uh, fair offices remained downtown until Miles Johnson built an administration building on the fairgrounds. Um, anybody know some of the places where the fair offices were held or were located? On West 4th Street, the, 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 oh, the Medler building, right next to that. The Medler building is where it was the longest. Uh, the first offices, of course, are no longer there. It's the building uh, that, used to ho that used to be home to insurance associates. Uh, Jeff Bonenkamp's building there on the corner. That's where the original chamber was when the fair first started. Uh, the Spencer Fire did affect the Clay County Fair at the fairgrounds in a fireproof safe in my office are all of the fair executive committee minutes and fair board minutes dating back to 1931. Anything prior to 31 burned in the fire. So, yeah. So you look at the list there of fair secretaries. Um, another kind of interesting thing, um, for the most part, Outside of, um, well, Ben Nelson, it's, it's very interesting. Ben Nelson uh, was hired as, as manager of the fair. Uh, he was the first full-time manager. And uh, after the fair, there, there are some mentions in fair board minutes that he claimed he was owed more for reimbursement for expenses. And then the next thing you knew, they were looking for a new manager. So <laughs> Ben, <laughs> I don't know anything about Ben. He came from Sioux Falls, but he is the shortest serving manager. And then it was followed by the longest, of course, Bill Woods. Um, what's interesting, too, is when you go back and research a lot of these people outside of, um, based on the research I could find, outside of Bill Woods and Phil Hurst, they all moved to Spencer to be involved with the fair. So if you just go back a little bit, of course, Miles Johnson came to Spencer uh, from the North Dakota State Fair and the Sioux Empire Fair. Jim Frost uh, from the Minnesota State Fair, and I came here from time at the Missouri State Fair. So, uh, and you get back a little further, um, R.E. Bucknell, for example, was hired away from the fair in Decorah in the 1920s. Um, Mr. Emery was uh, out of Minnesota, uh, a couple fairs in Minnesota, so kind of an interesting list there. But the guy I really want to talk about is this, the 
the first guy that got involved here, M.E. Bacon. So E.S. Perry, of course, was manager through the first fair in 1918. Uh, he left, and then M.E. Bacon became the manager. And so uh, it, it was very interesting that, um, well, it's just very interesting what Mr. Bacon did because according to the December 10th, 1919 Spencer Reporter, Bacon goes to Davenport. And this is very interesting. At this time, uh, every year, the fair managers and fair board would go to Chicago for a convention. And when you read this, it's very fascinating. Uh, Spencer is to lose Emmy Bacon, secretary of the Clay County Fair and the Spencer Commercial Club. Mr. Bacon returned home Saturday from Chicago, where he had been attending the meeting of the American State and District Fairs. En route home, he stopped at Davenport and closed a contract for three years' service with the new fair that is being organized. Uh, so he became the first manager of the Mississippi Valley Fair in Davenport. Uh, if you know anything, though, about the Mississippi Valley Fair in Davenport, obviously Mr. Bacon liked what he saw here. Because when you go to the Mississippi Valley Fair in Davenport today, this is their main entrance. <laughs> Look familiar? Theirs is a little bigger. Uh, the office space is a little bigger. But, um, yeah, Emmy Bacon would have been responsible for building that here in Spencer, and then he went across the state. Uh, coming home, you know, think about the Clay County Fair paying his business travel to go to Chicago for a meeting, and on the way back, he stopped and got another job. So... <laughs> Uh, I've got a lot of photos here we're just going to kind of click through that really just, I think, speak to the fair and what it's really about. You see some uh, 4-H youth out front of the, uh, the club building that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, the Million Dollar Livestock Parade was a huge attraction at the fair in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, all of the champion livestock would be paraded around the grandstand, which would be sold out at the time. And it was always said that the sale value of all those animals would be a million dollars. So it was the million dollar livestock parade. That was an afternoon event every year at the fair. And of course, um, there obviously was no fire marshal in Spencer at that time. Uh, I don't think, Alec, this would meet planning uh, or type things right here. Uh, and I know the fire department would not like it. But this photo is always interesting to me. One, just how people are crammed in the grandstand, but two, uh, that would be some hot clothing to wear to the fair on some days. Well, it's in September. Yeah, well, it's in September, yeah. <laughs> Another person with an interesting connection to the fair is the gentleman on the right, and that's Carl King. Uh, the famous Carl King band uh, performed at the Clay County Fair from 1922, uh, and starting in 1922, I'm sorry. And, and in 1952, uh, he was recognized for 30 years of service. Um, that was before there were concerts in the grandstand. Uh, the concerts really started in the late 1960s, uh, but from about the 1930s through that, uh, there were palace shows or review shows um, every night in front of the grandstand stage, different entertainers. Uh, we recreated part of that at our Centennial Fair, so you'd have some circus acts and some different people like that, but there had to be musical accompaniment. Of course, there wasn't you know, CDs at that time. So the Carl King Band uh, from Fort Dodge performed, and, and the gentleman there on the left handing him that award, whoops, this gentleman right here is one of the presidents of the fair board, uh, L.A. Witter, and then right back there is Bill Woods, who was manager of the fair at the time, and of course this is Carl King. So that was in 1952. I thought this, this picture is interesting. This is from the mid-1960s, but all of these uh, benches right in through here we still have and you still sit on. <laughs> they've been rebuilt a couple times, but uh, I wondered kind of where that design came from, and they've at least been on the fairground since the early 1960s. Those benches now, of course, this is in front of the grandstand now. Most of them are around our old office. So, And, of course, weather has always been an issue at the fair, and uh, this was just a rainy day uh, in the early late 60s, early 70s is what was on this photo. And how many of you were not allowed to eat at the fair? You had to eat out of the back of a vehicle. Several of you? <laughs> Just a family picnic? I think that's one area where the fair has really changed over the years. Um, you know, I, you laugh about it a little bit in today's world where, um, and my grandparents talk about this a lot too, that, you know, your, um, your parents, it was never safe to eat that food at the fairgrounds. 
but yet you could eat that potato salad and chicken out of the back of the car and be just fine. You know that. <laughs> different times, different times. Uh, but this is just a family enjoying lunch uh, out in the parking lot. So. And then here's a line uh, in, uh, for buying tickets in the grandstand, uh, lined up to get into one of the afternoon performances. Again, not sure of the year on this. You see, again, a lot of hats and, and ties, um, but uh, a big line. And there's also this kind of monstrosity, for lack of better words, right here. Um, and that is the Legion Drum Corps blanket tent, or blanket stand. So... In the early years of the fair, uh, the Drum and Bugle Corps of the Glenn Pedersen Post No. 1 American Legion and W.G. Sherman of Eagle Grove did a great volume of business on the Midway. And they erected these two stands, 36 feet long, and they put up to 4,000 blankets on the stands. And what this was is winners were determined by throwing a dart at a wheel um, and so it was basically a game of chance, but your prize was one of these, one of these blankets. Uh, it says here that it was in, uh, this was September 26, 1929, issue of the Spencer News Herald, that Mr. Sherman had been making the, had been making the fair for years and, had, er, years and had earned a reputation for being fair. Um, and so uh, just it was, the receipts were used to help def defray expenses to the 1930 Legion Convention, which was to be held in either Boston or Miami. So they put all these blankets up, and it's like a game of chance, and your prize to take home would be a blanket. So, Here's a photo inside the original uh, KICD Little Theater. How many of you remember going in the Little Theater? Okay. Um, you know, that building was originally designed to, to hold chickens and roosters, but then they decided to switch it over uh, to radio and television. So before the 1947 fair was to open, uh, fair management was in a quandary about how to fill a portion of the building. And Ben Sanders suggested that a model railroad would be a nice addition. Two carpenters, hundreds of board feet, and six days later, the Smoky Mountain Railroad started operation. A 45-foot loop of two tracks. It was an instant hit and surpassed the exhibit of wingless chickens on display from Iowa State University. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so Iowa State brought wingless chickens, and um, you know, interesting. You know, I, uh, uh, this is I. It seems like at the fair, and some of you that have been on the fair board can attest to this. Roy's finishing projects at the last minute. Well, we're not nailing boards the morning of the first day of the fair, and and they did the the railroad basically in six days is how it started. Um, but this is a, a major year. This will be the 75th anniversary, when you do the math, uh, from 1947. 75th anniversary of the Smoky Mountain Railroad will be this year. And, of course, it's grown and has become a huge attraction uh, in its own right. Um, and uh, a lot of things going on there. And then the photographer of the next photo is in the room, I believe. Isn't that yours, Judy? Uh, I was on that. Oh, was that? Okay. Oh, this is Theon Quattlebaum's photo. This photo was taken in one of the fair's free entertainment tents, and they had just been told that the Twin Towers had been struck. This is September 11th, 2001, at the Clay County Fair. How many of you were at the fair that day? You know, for some people, that was the first, um, that was where they first heard about it. You know, I think we all, we all were, where were you when? And for a lot of people in Northwest Iowa, they were at the fair. They were at the fair that day. Just, yeah, go ahead, Judy. Just for the record, this is from Friday during the memorial Okay, service. I'm sorry. Very good. Okay, so this was from the Friday of that week during memorial service. Okay. I've been fact-checked. That's good. We don't want any fake news out of it tonight, that's for sure. Okay. All right, we've talked about the people. Now let's, let's talk a little bit about the place. So the first fair, of course, in 1918, um, really featured three structures. Uh, there were several sheds and tents that were put up for livestock exhibits, but really three permanent buildings were constructed. Uh, the first one, of course, is the, the main gate, uh, which is, of course, still in existence. Um, 
And at that time, the main gate actually did hold uh, the offices. The fair secretary was in one office and the fair treasurer was in the other. Uh, so that, that were, was the offices. Um, and then they used the towers uh, as they could go up and look, look out over the grounds. So that was kind of the design of that structure. Um, it was also designed as pedestrian only. And we'll, in a minute, look at the, uh, the auto gate. Then there are two other major buildings constructed. One was the women's building. We'll talk about it more in just a second. And then the other was the original wooden grandstand. So the women's building um, is right there, obviously, a two-story building that was known for its uh, pl southern plantation look uh, with the large porch and the balcony. It sits... Um, they built it at an odd angle, but, and you can kind of see the foundations a little bit of it, but it sits south of what is now um, the uh, Tower Gate Pavilion is basically where it sits. So it, it sits right along 4th Avenue West. Uh, it was built for $5,500. Uh, the main level was restrooms and rest areas. There was concern that um, the ladies would not be able to keep up with their husbands through the machinery exhibits. And so they needed rocking chairs and places to rest. And so that was the first floor of this building. The second floor of the building was full of what was called fancy work, which was quilts uh, and, and other exhibits like that. But that was the women's building. Uh, later it became home to uh, some 4-H exhibits, uh, and I am unsure when this building was tore down. Would anybody, Glenn, would you? I'm a, I, I really don't know when this building was tore down. Probably in the late 40s or in that Okay, late 40s or early 50s. Okay. Yep. All right. We talked about the automobile gate. They had parking problems early at the fair. Um, but this little auto gate... Um, is south of the current main gate. So when you're on the fairgrounds now, I'm sorry, not south, north. Um, when you drive along 4th Avenue West, you see the, the, the main gate, and then to the north, there's that other little gate with the driveway. That's where this sat. And as you can see, it had uh, kind of a little tower look over it with, with kind of the white fencing. But I love how all of the, uh, how all the cars are wedged in there. I don't know, I, I, I am unsure... If these, uh, if these cars under the tent were like an exhibit or if, you know, the board president got to park there, I'm, I don't know what that was exactly. But obviously uh, they didn't have really good parking staff there. That would have been kind of hard to get out of if you were stuck. Obviously the first person there was the last person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, and who knows? That may have been like the first parking lot in northwest Iowa. I, I mean, I, I don't know where else there would have been that big a collection of, of cars. <laughs> So just an aerial view, um, we know this photo uh, was taken in 1923. Uh, it was the first year that the agriculture building was built. So if you look here, you see gate A, uh, you see the women's building, uh, you see, of course, the grandstand, um, and then uh, uh, the ag building was there, and then all the livestock barns and sheds were more back off this way. No, it is not. So this, we'll talk about that in a minute, but this whole thing was tore down. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, yep. And then in the early 1930s, uh, the fairgrounds started expanding, expanding west. So there was a, an exhibit building put here. And then, of course, you see this large building here that we're going to talk again a little more about. That was the Boys and Girls Club building. This is a, an interesting building. It was built in 1929. Uh, for $27,500. Uh, it is, was called the finest and only one of its kind on any fairgrounds in America. Um, it provided exhibit space. It also it provided dormitory space. Um, the livestock barns were added as wings. Uh, this building was tore down in 1953 so that the commercial exhibits building could be constructed on its spot. So when you're at the fairgrounds, the commercial exhibits building with the kind of the half dome, that this building was on that location. So, so that was straight in from the front gate. 
Yeah. Right. Yep. And you go back to this photo here, you can see that. Uh, and Glenn is exactly right. So it wasn't exactly where the building sat. It's really where the street is that runs south of that building. But yeah, and so the, the idea was you had the main gate, then you had this big building at the end, and the fair was supposed to fit in between. <laughs> and obviously when commercial exhibit building was built, uh, you know, they needed to make some changes. So. so that leads us to the property of the fair association. Um, so we talked about, this is kind of hard to see, but you kind of see the square right there, which includes the racetrack. If you're familiar with the fairgrounds today, you basically take the racetrack, go west of the event center, and then the road that runs south of the livestock pavilion, uh, the depot, this square, that's that original 40 acres uh, that Clay County purchased and just recently gave to the fair. That's really a very funny story. Uh, it, it really is because we had assumed that we owned it. The county had no idea that they owned it. And uh, we were working with our attorney just to do some title pin to clean it up. And he's like, There's, there is no record that that land was ever transferred to the Fair Association. <laughs> so um, anyway, so that's the original 40. Um, and then parcel number four, which is across the street, uh, across the street from 4th Avenue West, was purchased uh, in 1934. Uh, parcel 6, which is a large chunk, basically extending the fairgrounds all the way to 11th Avenue, was purchased in 1936, which again is very fascinating. Why are you buying land in the Depression? I mean, you know, what's your vision? What, what's, <laughs> what, what, you know, I, I, maybe land was cheap. I'm sure there are a lot of issues going on, but still, I mean, you're, you're building... Uh, you're expanding, and then, of course, most of the, the cattle barns were all built in the 1930s. You know, huge expansion going on. So Parcel 6, which, again, uh, still, though, that road south of the outdoor arena. So Parcel 6 was in 1936. In 1950, Parcel 3 was purchased, basically between uh, 10th Avenue East. No, I'm sorry, 3rd Avenue East and the railroad tracks. Uh, so... That was built or that was purchased in 1950. 1965, this southern portion was purchased. So basically, everything south, when you, again, if you drive through the fairgrounds on that main, come in Gate C, the depot, uh, the outdoor arena, but all of that south was purchased in 1965. Uh, then in 1980, uh, all the property across the street was purchased. Uh, in 1996, the fair purchased the Wadby property, the home that was kind of right here as you entered the fairgrounds. Of course, at that time, before the event center was built, this was the main entrance into the fairgrounds, what is now our pit gate. Uh, but this was the main entrance that took you in, and then it got moved with the event center. Uh, in, then in 2004, uh, this piece was purchased, which is the fair's maintenance shop. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of history on when all that property was purchased. Yeah, Merlin. Is that property of the scene ever going to be acquired? <laughs> well, uh, you know, if uh, the owners of the property would like to sell it, we'd sure talk to them, that's for sure. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it's, you know, I don't want to comment on anybody's property. You want to keep your property, I guess, so, yeah. So in 1931, uh, this building was going up. What else happened in 1931? Spencer. The Spencer Fire. Um, the $45,000 steel and concrete grandstand with a seating capacity of 5,000 was built in the year of the Great Fire, 1931. With a $700,000 rebuilding program underway and new buildings rising from the ashes in downtown Spencer, Spencer businessmen still loaned the Fair Association money for erection of the grandstand. So that's in 1931. Now, to Bill's point, what they did, uh, if we go back here, um, the, the wooden bleachers were taken down. This portion of the grandstand was split in half and moved to either side. See that right there? That's the old grandstand. <laughs> they, 
They moved half of it there, and they moved half of it here for additional seating. There was no annex on the grandstand at that time. There was no, there was no annex. Uh, so in 1931, uh, the grandstand was built. What's interesting is the grandstand originally was an open frame structure. It wasn't until 1934 that the walls were put on the grandstand, and it was turned into exhibit space underneath. It originally was just an open steel structure with no exhibit. There were no walls on it. It was just like bleachers. Um, and then in 1936, the old sections were removed and the annex was constructed. And here in a minute, well, I'll show you a picture of what the grandstand looked like before the annex. Uh, but in 1936 is when the annex was put on and, and basically the grandstand achieved its, its current form. As many of you know, um, until 1980, uh, the carnival was east of the grandstand. Uh, 4th Avenue West was closed, uh, and this is a picture of the Art Thomas shows, uh, which was the carnival provider for many years. Uh, but the, the carnival is east of the grandstand. When the fair um, acquired the property to the north uh, in, in 1980 and parking moved to the north, that's when camping came over and all of the, light, or all of the machinery exhibits expanded um, really expanded into, when you, when you look at old fair maps, this section five right in here that was purchased in the 60s was all parking. Um, and of course, this was a lot of parking. And then when, when this became available, the parking moved there and the carnival, of course, moved here and a lot of machinery expanded down here. But prior to 1980, the carnival, as you all know, was right here uh, with, with that street blocked. This is just another photo just of the grounds. Um, so you see the building here. Uh, you see the building here is the industrial building. That was the original industrial building. It got replaced with this building uh, in 1968. Um, but that is on the same location. So it kind of shows you where you're looking at. So the cattle barns are here. Here's the road. Of course, livestock pavilions down here. There, of course, is the original uh, little theater, the original KICD studio. Of course, you know, you see that's, that's the property line of the fair is right there. That's that road that the, the new depot sits right in here. But again, that was the edge of the fairgrounds at that time. So was that a public street at the time? Though? That I don't know. That's a good question. I, I think most of the streets um, were still considered public streets. You know, we still have all the street signs. That it is still with the city grid. So, yeah. Uh, this is another picture just, you know, back to the beginning, I guess you could say. Um, but look at all the people up on that balcony enjoying the view. Uh, and then you can see in better in this picture, of course, this is from one of the early fairs. As mentioned, back in the background, kind of the sheds and the tents for the livestock shows. And then here's a photo, uh, the grandstand without the annex. So this, this is built, this is sometime... Uh, between 1931 and 1936, you see the grandstand. There's the half of the old grandstand that got split in half and moved. Um, and then, of course, today there's an annex here um, off to the side. But that's what the grandstand looked like, especially with the windows. Uh, and um, we would love uh, one of the plans, future plans for the fair is restoration of the grandstand and to go back to those windows and the murals and, and those types of things um, to really uh, address that back up. So I, I want to end tonight talking about the vision of the fair. And I, I've talked about it a couple times, but um, you, you look at the October 10th, 1918 uh, Daily Re or Spencer Reporter. The fair was a success from every standpoint. The weather was ideal. The crowds were large. The fair program was carried out according to schedule, and there was something doing every minute of the day and night. There is, no reason to there is every reason to believe that next year's fair will far surpass the 1918 fair, both from the standpoint of attendance and from the standpoint of exhibits and amusement. The huge crowds were handled well, so well there were no accidents of any kind. Not an automobile was smashed up, which is amazing in that parking lot. Uh, not a person was injured. The most perfect order was kept on the grounds, and the police facilities were unsurpassed. You can't do it, was what many a fair secretary said, but it was done. A dozen or more fair officials from other fairs and from the Iowa State Fair were among the visitors. They could hardly believe their eyes, so great was the fair. 
More buildings will be built during the coming year, and the second annual fair will see the fairgrounds more nearly completed and even better equipped to handle the great crowds. Bill. With all the expansion in the buildings, did, did the fair board borrow money, or a lot of it was contribution? Um, that, that's a good question. Uh, it was what they would do is they would go back to the stockholders and basically borrow from the stockholders. The first time the fair actually borrowed money was the purchase of the Poland property in 1980. Prior to 1980, the fair had never borrowed money from a bank. Now, you, you talk, the businessmen donated money to build the grandstand. Uh, I have several, I have a file that in 1953, uh, they went back to the membership and that's how they built the commercial exhibits building. And they actually paid that back. You, you actually bought, you know, you, you, they loaned, they, but it was always from the membership. Yeah. Uh, in the report to the membership in 1918, Fair Secretary Emmy Bacon, before he went to Davenport, said, while the 1918 fair is a great success, the management is already planning to make the 1919 fair so much bigger and better that the 18 fair, there'll be no comparison. Um, I think what's interesting about the fair from the very beginning, and I don't want to, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but sometimes in small communities, there's this uh, sense of it's mine. I don't want to share, right? I mean, you see, that, let, you, you have to be real. You see that in, you know, churches closing, rural schools closing. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's mine. I'm not going to share. What's fascinating is the vision of the fair. In 1922, the stockholders, the members of the fair association, approved a plan to sell $10,000 in stock to Dickinson County residents, and they were going to change the name of the fair to the Twin County Fair. Uh, a partial bit of that was raised, uh, but it never went through. But, I mean, can you imagine that today? An organization saying, let's change the name of this thing and get more people involved. 1922. So the fair is four years old. In 1928... The county beef show became the district beef show. That's when they started inviting the world. 1928. 1931, the county swine show became a district show. You know, so from the very beginning, um, the fair wanted to expand. Uh, this article is fascinating. This is from uh, the reporter in 1918. Again, the executive committee voted to send Emmy Bacon uh, to the Iowa Fair Meeting and then the American Association of State and Interstate Fairs, which is a forerunner to the International Association of Fairs, which I'm privileged to be chair of right now. Um, but you look here at the bottom. Members of the Executive Committee believe that the Clay County Fair should be represented at these meetings. The local fair is one of the real big fairs in the state. They've had one and is on pair with some of the state fairs staged in some states. They've had one. The local fair is going to be even a bigger and better fair and certainly can benefit by mingling an aristocratic company such as the Association of State and Interstate Fairs. They'd had one fair. I mean, you talk about a lot of, a lot of guts on that committee. Um, and then you look at the circuit. Now, this is fair stationary, and I was hope this is a letter actually addressed to Mr. Ivan Reed in Peterson, Iowa, which I would assume would be, yeah. I would assume it would be Ivan's dad. But anyway, dated 1931, and it goes, why not make the circuit? And so uh, at that time, the Clay County Fair was, referred to, was referring to itself as the Clay County Fair, and I'll tell, or World's Greatest County Fair. I'll tell that story in a minute. But the circuit that the fair was involved with, Davenport, that's the Mississippi Valley Fair. Des Moines, that's the Iowa State Fair. Hamlin, that's the Minnesota State Fair. Huron, that's the South Dakota State Fair. Spencer, Iowa, and then at that time... The second largest fair in the state was the National Cattle Congress in Waterloo. Yeah. But, you know, they, again, 1931, they'd, they'd only been around for 10 years. <laughs> you know, they, they hadn't been doing this for a long time. So uh, the vision of the fair executive committee from the beginning and the community is very fascinating. That, you know, the, this fair didn't, like, grow over time. The very first year, it was the biggest fair ever. And, and then they just thought, well, that's how it is. Um, what's interesting is... Uh, they, their goal at the 1927 fair, again, the fair had been in existence for less than 10 years, was 100,000 paid admission. That was their theme. <laughs> 100,000 paid admission in 1927. Uh, but it was wet and cold and only 67,000 people came. So 1928, uh, Senator Charles Curtis of Kansas, the Republican nominee for vice president, 
helped attain that $100,000 record by packing listeners into the grandstand. His address delivered at the Clay County Fair Grandstead echoed around the entire country when he told a heckler, you're too damn dumb to understand. <laughs> I'd love to know who the Spencer person was. <laughs> it was heckling. Um, that year, 110,105 people attended the fair. That's 1928. So the fair is 10 years old, and at that time, the fair became the world's greatest county fair. All official lit literature since that time, since 1932, carried the slogan. In uh, 1932, Leo Daly, the fair secretary, explained that that slogan was taken when statistics proved that the Clay County Fair was the largest county fair in the United States at that time. Um, we no longer hold that title. There are some other fairs, county fairs. Uh, the San Diego County Fair is larger attendance than us. The Los Angeles County Fair in Pomona, California. The Erie County Fair in Buffalo, New York. There are a few that are larger than us. 1965, and uh, with this I'm done. Fair Board President Bob Keir in his report to the membership said, the fair is you. It's alive, growing, meeting new challenges. We're proud of our fair, old as it is, but as new as it must be because we believe it is our duty as custodians of your fair to give you an attractive program. This is your fair designed with you in mind. And I think that's what we've really continued uh, since that. Some other resources for you if you want to know more. Uh, there was a, the Palimpsest, I think I pronounced that right, is a magazine put out by the State Historical Society in Iowa. In 1950, they had a whole issue focused on the Clay County Fair. Mary Houston uh, wrote a book in 1992 uh, many of you probably have that at home, saluting 75 years of people, pride, and progress. Uh, Arla Kintai in 2017 wrote a book, Fairgoers Do Not Live on Fried Food Alone. I know you can purchase that, I think, at Arts on Grand. Uh, the Fair did a centennial book in 2017. And then the Fair Archives, uh, in our old office back uh, in, in the back, is, is the Fair Archives. And it truly is an archives. We partner with Clay County Heritage. Um, every item in that archives has been cataloged and is part of the Parker system. So if you want to go see what the entertainment was in 1929, we've got, I mean, Braden at Clay County Heritage can look it up and we know exactly where it is. Uh, it's all been cataloged. All these photos came out of the fair archives. Uh, there are thousands more, thousands more. Um, so that's kind of where we are with that. So questions? Yes, Sam. Can you make a comment? Sure. <laughs> then you got the parking lot north of the fairground, and it got better yet. <laughs> it used to be back in the era, big camp oh. bands were in. Sorry, I forgot about that. And people, everybody was parked in like all the, uh, the front. I hate that. I've never beat them. The, the only thing with parking up there originally was everybody parked generally in their yards. Probably some of them paid, but you couldn't see to get out. You could hardly. We backed in our driveway for decades and decades <laughs> because you couldn't see to get out. And people go, well, it'll be late tonight. And I said, forget it, back in now. Or, and the, the first time, if somebody would come and park at night to go to the grandstand, second time they'd be backing in because there, you sat there and you just couldn't get out. And then the north went open. And safety-wise, that, that was just tremendous. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Or? Oh, Merlin? Here, bring this over to you. The racetrack, it always been a, was it? Oh, go ahead. The racetrack, was it more than a half mile previously? Is it still a half mile? Yeah. Good question. Uh, that's a good question. So it uh, originally was half mile, was a half mile dirt horse racing track. Uh, in 2007, it was replaced with a three eighths mile banked clay track. But yet the, the Clay County Fairgrounds never had a mile racetrack. The half mile was, was the biggest track. And it was there till 2007. What's a three-eighths? What do you mean by three-eighths? It's three-eighths of a mile. Now. Yeah, now, it, yeah, three-eighths of a mile. That's kind of the perfect distance for racing, I guess, banked. So, yep, three-eighths. And at that time, it was, of course, half-mile flat dirt track. Now it's the three-eighths banked clay. Yep. Jerry, what, what would you... I'm still saying this so they can get you, so they can hear you online. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to see in the future? Could you give me two or three things you think would be really great that we could add to the fair? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. So, you know, what do we want to add to the fair? Um, I, I think 
I think the first thing we have to do uh, is there are, there's one facility for sure on the grounds, two facilities that really we have to look at um, improving and, and restoring. One of those is the grandstand. It's 100 years old. Um, and just appearance, it, it needs a facelift for sure. But just also in today's world with restrooms and handicap accessibility, that building, you know, the grandstand was not built for that. Uh, so I think that's something... Um, you know, I talked for a long time about this, but if the fair wants to continue to bring concerts in, big concerts in, we have to have a better facility because what we have is is not up to par. So that's something we have to think about. The other thing is um, our cattle barns uh, desperately need some work. So so there's some new facilities I think that we need to do. Um, I, I think, you know, facilities are part of it. Um, I think, though, from a programming perspective, I think we're going to have to continue to push, and I think you're going to probably see us more, try to be more involved a little bit in the public eye because it's, it's hard to get volunteers. It's hard to recruit that support. Um, but I, I, think, I think that's the second thing, and I think some, some facility improvements are, are desperately needed, um, but uh, really it's, it's going to be just to make sure we're keeping you know, the, the fair alive and going. It, it obviously has been for over 100 years and, and really keeping that big vision. Uh, alive that's really made the fair go. Jeremy, do you think if COVID wouldn't have happened, the three, two or three things you just mentioned would have been more closer to coming to fruition? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, you know, COVID for us really has put a, um, it really put a stop on things. Uh, obviously, when you when it's a 260 acre property, that's over. You know, if you own a a 100-year-old house, you can't go a couple years and not do anything to it. Well, we did <laughs> to more than one house, to 60 buildings and 260 acres. And so um, yeah, that's kind of affected that a little bit. Um, and so it, you know, it, it comes back to, and obviously you can't build buildings anymore for $5,000 or $27,000 either. You know? so, um, but it's also about protecting what we have. Um, you know, the commercial exhibits building is a beautiful structure when you get inside of that with the wood, you know, the wood ceiling inside. But it was built in 1954. Um, you know, even some other buildings, uh, industrial building, 4-H building, you know, those buildings were built in the 60s. So there's just a lot of upkeep that has to be done. Um, people's expectations are higher today when they go to events. You know, they, they want nicer bathrooms. They want paved streets. They want all those types of things. So... Uh, you know, we're going to have to continue to, to move forward in that area. But, yeah, COVID definitely was, was not something we'd like to do again, for sure. Any other questions? or Mr. Rose? Are you kicking me off? No. Oh. One, more, uh, one more thing. I'd like to have you talk about your fundraiser coming up oh. soon. And uh, if you can just uh, uh, maybe quickly point out the economic you know, advantage of having the fair. Yeah, sure. So, um, first of all, so I talked about new facilities. So, how are we going to pay for those new facilities? Well, one of the things that the fair did in the um, that Jim Frost during his tenure, uh, you know, Jim Jim Frost's tenure as manager of the fair was relatively brief when you look at the timeline. But some major things happened during Jim's tenure. One of those was the fact that the fair was zoned uh, a fair district by the city. Uh, which allows some extra flexibility with some of the things we do. The second thing, what? Yeah, well, <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. But, uh, the, the, second, <laughs> the second piece of that was uh, the local option sales tax, the one cent local option sales tax that went to the school, went to the city, 10% went to the fair, which allowed for the construction of the event center. And then the third thing that Jim did during his tenure was the creation of the charitable trust. And the charitable trust uh, the Fair Association is a 501c5 organization, which is interesting in, in the tax world. 501c5s are ag societies or horse racing facilities. There's your, there's your did you know, Prairie Meadows Racetrack in Des Moines is a 501c5 nonprofit, same as the Clay County Fair. Yeah, it's an ag society. Uh, but, of course, ag societies, if you donate to an ag society, you don't get the, the benefit. So the Fair established the charitable trust, which is basically our foundation, which is a 501c3, which then means donors can donate and, and get the tax benefits from that. So uh, a long story to say, our charitable trust on June 4th is having a fundraising event. It's called Farm to Fork Fundraiser. Um, 
obviously the mission of the fair is agriculture and agriculture education. So it's a, a locally produced meal. It's all food that uh, is going to come from people that will be there that night and tell you where the ingredients came from because they raised them or grew those ingredients. Um, and then uh, there's entertainment with the Britons. There's a silent auction, a live auction, just a big fundraiser uh, for, the, for the Fair Charitable Trust. And you can purchase those tickets online at our website or you can go to the Fair office. Um, the second thing you wanted me to talk about was, do you remember? Oh, economic impact. Thank you. I'm glad you remember, Bob. Again, you remember way more than I do. You straightened me out a lot. Yeah, no. So we had an economic impact study done about, it's been about 10 years now, uh, 10 years ago. And what we did is we focused on how much did people outside of Clay County spend in Clay County not at the fairgrounds. Now, I know that doesn't make a lot of sense. but So basically, if you live in Royal and came to Spencer to either the fair or something that happened at the fairgrounds throughout the year, auto race, a wedding reception, we didn't count you. But if you lived outside the county and drove into Spencer, how much did you spend in the community not at the fairgrounds? So at a gas station, at a, a convenience store, at a restaurant at the mall or you know what how much did you spend and 10 years ago that number was between five and six million dollars uh just direct spend and that that's not an economic impact multiplier that was just the direct spend uh we have auto racing coming up we know from that study uh that racers spend about a hundred dollars a night in spencer on fuel or food or something not at the racetrack um when you look at what we did last year, just the speedway alone, just the drivers, that was about an $88,000 impact on the local economy. So, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things of what we do really keep uh, businesses in, in Spencer going, uh, especially as we bring people in on a year-round basis. So, uh, you know, that's kind of our goal as well to, um, if you're the thing that the community is known for, you'd better do a good job, right? <laughs> um, and so that's, that's kind of what we uh, really focus on, so. An hour, right? We did it. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> well, Jeremy, thank you so much. This has been a very, very interesting. Most of us thought we knew a lot about the fair, but every time I hear you talk, I learn something new. So, hey, it, it's been wonderful. This is our final one. Oh, you, Kathy, you have a you question. You mentioned about Jeremy is the president of the International Fair oh. Association. That is a huge deal. Are you the youngest one that's ever been? <laughs> you, you may be, but you're the best one, oh, I'm okay. sure. So, um, as I talked about a little bit ago, you know, in 1918, they, they sent Emmy Bacon to the Association of Interstate Fairs. Uh, and that organization morphed into the International Association of Fairs and Expositions. And again, the Clay County Fair has been an active member of the IAFE uh, since its inception. And so, um, as Kathy mentioned, I have the honor this year of serving as chairman of, of the International Association of Fairs. Um, the IAFE is about 140 years old, and only eight of us have been county fair managers. They've always been from state fairs. Uh, I'm also fortunate, I'm of those eight, Two have been from Clay County. The other one was Miles Johnson uh, in 1990. And Miles, of course, is now members of the IFE Hall of Fame. Uh, Miles is as well. So um, it's good to follow in those footsteps, and, and thank you for that, Kathy. I'm, not the, I'm the second youngest chair ever in history, uh, but uh, uh, definitely proud to represent Iowa. Um, even of those 140 years in the IFE, uh, Miles and myself, and I think it's three managers of the Iowa State Fair have had that position. So um, definitely an honor to represent uh, Spencer and the Clay County Fair in the last year. So thank you, Kathy. Well, thanks again, Jeremy. Yep. Uh, very informative. So uh, this is the final of our five presentations this year, and all have been extremely interesting. And this one <clears throat> right up there at the top of those. So anyway, uh, we want to thank the City of Spencer for allowing us to be in this building. And uh, most of all, thanks to all of you for supporting this. And uh, I think we ought to do this again next year. So 
Thank you very much.